Thank you all for joining us today. This is session two of our Remote Sensing for Monitoring Land Degradation and Sustainable Cities SDGs. Again, my name is Amber McCollum, and I will be your presenter along with our, uh, once again, fabulous guest speakers. Um, this week, we will also have uh, Pablo Ovalas from the Dominican Republic, and um, he's going to provide us with a perspective on country reporting. So we're really excited to have that perspective with us here today. And um, once again, we have our colleagues with CI who are going to be really focusing on their trends.earth tool. So we're excited to have them back as well. A few reminders before we begin today. This training will have three one and a half hour sessions. We had our session last week on July 9th, this week, July 16th, and then again, um, our final session will be a week from today on July 23rd. Note that you only need to attend one session per day. The same material is presented twice each day, but session B is going to be given live in Spanish. You can find all the course materials listed on the website here, and this will include the recordings, the presentations, and the homework assignment um, that will be provided next week. We will have some time for questions at the end of the, each session, but if you don't get your question answered or have a follow-up, you can email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at our emails listed there. We will have one follow-on homework and that will be available on the course website. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all of your answers via via Google Forms by the deadline. And again, note that deadline is August 6th. And as I mentioned earlier, the homework will span across the entire training. So just be aware of that when you're um, completing it. You will receive a certificate of completion if you attend all of the live webinars, all three, um, and complete the homework by the uh, deadline. These Certificates take a little while to process, so please be patient um, and give about two months from the end of this training until you receive your certificate. Again, as I mentioned last week, these are the prerequisites for this course. Um, having a fundamentals of remote sensing and really importantly, having QGIS downloaded and installed and having the correct version of QGIS. So we recommend 2.18.15. And then you must download, install, and register the trends.earth plugin for QGIS in order to complete the exercises. So that's really an important piece to completing those aspects before um, you, you try to go through the exercises. Again, you can access all the course materials on our website listed here. And this will be a PowerPoint presentation of the English and Spanish, a PDF of each week's exercise, and the link to the recording. Um, eventually, a few days after each session, we will have the link to the recording up there that you can watch. And then finally, the homework um, Google Form link will be there as well. So last week, we really focused on this overview of S SDG 15 and um, started to get an introduction to the Trends.Earth tool. And then this week, we're going to hear more about global data sets and um, some of their uh, pros and cons. So thinking about the limitations of some of these global data sets, and that's really important too. And then we're going to have this um, country-specific example which we're really um, thrilled to have. So first we're going to hear from Conservation International about these global data sets and some of their limitations. Um, and then we'll hear from Pablo about um, country measuring and reporting. And um, we're really thrilled to have this perspective. And then we're gonna focus finally on doing a, a, an exercise with the tool as well. So now I'd like to hand it over to our guest speakers um, and thank them all for being here again today. And um, I will let them have full reign. Uh, so 
Thank you, Amber, for the introduction. Again, my name is Alex Wallaf. I am Senior Director of Resilient Science at Conservation International. And uh, in this session, we'll be talking about how to use custom data within the Trends.Earth tool for monitoring land degradation. So a quick review for those of you who uh, didn't see the first session. Uh, Trends.Earth, again, is a tool uh, for monitoring land condition and support of monitoring, in particular, SDG 15.3.1, uh, which is land degradation neutrality. And it's a free and open source tool that supports monitoring all three components of that indicator. So that's land productivity, land cover, and carbon stocks. You saw in the last session how to use trends.earth to monitor these three indicators using global data sets. What we'll show in this session is how you can use custom, local, or national level data within trends.earth to monitor these indicators. So again, as we mentioned before, there's three different indicators that go into 15.3.1, land productivity, land cover, and soil organic carbon. What I'm gonna focus on here today is how we can use custom to national level data sets in particular to support land cover. You can use custom data for all three indicators. The example I'll show you here today is geared around land cover, but again, just to know we do support uh, custom data sets for all three of the indicators. A little bit of quick review here. Uh, what is the land cover indicator? Again, this uh, land cover change describes changes in the biophysical character of the Earth's surface. Uh, and what we're particularly interested in for the SDG is transitions and land cover. So that could be uh, forest to grassland, for example, grassland uh, to urban areas. What you see here on the bottom of the slide as an example from the Amazon uh, of land cover maps from 1992 to 2015. So trends.earth can be used to monitor changes in land cover uh, over time. And again, the way that works is combining two different maps. Uh, so for example, 2001 to 2015, if we have two different land cover maps derived from satellite imagery, we can derive a map of transitions between land cover. And using that transition matrix we talked about in the first session, we can arrive at a map of potential land degradation. That transition matrix is shown again here. Uh, as you can see, areas in green are areas we consider to be improvement. Red are transitions we consider to be degradation. And again, I uh, encourage you to listen to session one for more information on this transition matrix. So our focus here today is going to be on how we can use uh, custom data sets uh, in place of some of the global data sets that are used in trends.earth. So what I'd like to talk about first is uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of using local data in place of the global data sets provided in trends.earth. So the first thing I wanna focus on are resolution and accuracy. Some of these will of course be a uh, review for some of you, but just to show you an example of what I mean here, what you see on this page is the global land cover data that is used by default in the trends.earth tool. Uh, this again is from the European Space Agency. This is the CCI uh, land cover data set. Uh, this is a 300 meter resolution data set that's available from uh, starting in 1992 and then it extends uh, through uh, 2015. So this is uh, a global data set uh, that's available uh, by default within trends.earth. How does this compare uh, to other data sets that might be of higher resolution? So here what we're talking about is spatial resolution. So that's the size of the pixel, the individual units uh, that make up that land cover map. What you see on the left-hand side uh, are images from 2008 and 2014 from that European Space Agency CCI land cover change data set. Uh, again, it's a 300 meter data set. On the right-hand side, uh, what you see are images uh, from uh, product produced by uh, the SLEEK system in Kenya, as well as RCMRD, which is the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development, which is based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, they're the NASA Severe partner in the region, and they produce land cover maps for a number of countries in East Africa. Uh, but what you see here is the 30 meter compared to the 300 meter map. Of course, the first thing that you see is the large difference in the size of the pixels. We're able to make out 
much more detailed information in terms of spatial scale when we use that higher resolution data set on the right. Uh, you'll also notice uh, there's some differences in the classes we're able to detect. As you can see on the southern side of the lake, we can make out uh, more detail in terms of the forest cover that is missed from the global non cover product on the left. So why is it beneficial to have local data sets? Well, as I showed you before, uh, with local data sets, oftentimes we can get uh, higher uh, spatial resolution in terms of the maps that we're able to produce. Uh, it's also possible to get higher accuracy and precision uh, when we have products that are validated locally. To show an example of uh, what this can mean, again, in terms of resolution, here we're looking at very high resolution imagery. Uh, so commercial satellite imagery here on the left, uh, going up through the size of a Landsat pixel uh, on the far right. So that's a 30 by 30 meter uh, pixel on the far right. On the left-hand side is a one by one meter resolution pixel. Again, of course, this is the same story as what we saw uh, in Ethiopia, but with the higher resolution sensor, we're able to make out much more detail in terms of the actual land cover types uh, that are present in this image. So what we see here is an example uh, from Mount Kenya, and we see a similar picture uh, to what I just showed you in terms of resolution. On the right-hand side, we have an image uh, taken from the European Space Agency uh, uh, CCI land cover change product at 300 meter resolution. On the left-hand side, we have an image uh, derived from Sentinel imagery uh, that's 20 meter resolution. And what you can see is with the higher resolution imagery, we're able to get a more detailed picture of what's actually going on uh, at the summit of Mount Kenya, where on the right-hand side from the CCI land cover product, it's all mapped as the same class. Now, in comparing these two images, it's useful to think of the concepts of precision versus accuracy. So I just want to uh, give a more technical explanation of these two terms before we return to that image of Mount Kenya. So what you see here is an image uh, showing uh, the idea of precision versus accuracy. So imagine that we're looking at a target and all of those yellow dots are uh, trying to hit the middle of that target, that circle in the middle. On the left-hand side, on the upper left, we have an image that's neither precise nor accurate. Uh, those yellow dots aren't hitting the center, nor are they in any consistent pattern. On the right-hand side, we have an image that shows those yellow dots all clustered around that center of the target. So that's precise and it's accurate. On the bottom middle, we see an image that's precise but inaccurate. There's high precision because all those dots are all clustered around the same area, but it's the wrong area. It's not the center of the target. So it's precise but inaccurate. So if we return to that image of Mount Kenya, what we can see is that we're able to get uh, much greater precision in terms of uh, the number of classes that we're able to map close to the su summit of Mount Kenya. And we have that higher precision due to the greater degree of information at a fine spatial scale that's afforded us by that high resolution imagery. To assess whether uh, our observations are also accurate, it can be useful to actually conduct a validation. And so a validation exercise is something that can be done uh, particularly with custom uh, national data, and it can ensure that you have a relative uh, level of accuracy and precision that is needed uh, for your land cover change products. So what might that look like? Uh, this is an example of a framework used uh, by the Vital Signs Project, uh, which is a project uh, Conservation International has uh, active in Rwanda. And this is showing uh, all of those red dots are points on the ground that were visited in the field and the land cover at that, pro at that point rather uh, was recorded so that it could be used to validate a land cover product. So in other words, we can actually use that on the ground information from the field to assess the accuracy of the land cover maps that we're producing. If we shift to the right-hand side, uh, what we're showing is an example of what can happen, particularly if you have a lower resolution data set. So imagine on the left-hand side, uh, we have a patch of land that's covered in grass, and then on the right-hand side, uh, we have water. 
when a sensor is viewing that, so if we step down to the line that says sensor recording, if we have a fairly coarse, uh, meaning not a high resolution sensor, it will be trying to split that image up into say three different pixels. So the one on the far left is a pure image of grass, the one on the far right is a pure image of water, and then the one in the middle is mixed. If you have a very like, coarse resolution sensor, mapping that class in the middle is going to be difficult because you're likely to have confusion between those two classes. There's different ways to address this. You could add uh, another class to your classification, a mixed class between grass and water, uh, which would improve the, the precision of your data. Or of course, you could also increase the resolution of your data itself such that you can map a pure pixel of grass on the left, pure pixel of grass water on the right, and then uh, pixels representing that mixed class in the middle. So to summarize, why do we support custom uh, local data in trends.earth? Uh, this is not to say that uh, global data sets are not valuable or accurate or precise, they are, uh, but it is certainly possible uh, at the local to national scale uh, to improve the quality of products uh, using locally available uh, information. Uh, it's important to consider the quality of global data sets in the area in which you're interested in working, uh, to understand uh, their relative accuracy and precision in the area in which you work, and to uh, understand the limitations of the data in the particular uh, place in which you might be conducting an analysis. Uh, and then, of course, there's another point that I haven't touched on yet, which is using uh, nationally available information can be particularly important uh, in terms of reporting uh, if a country has a national land cover data set that has already been agreed to or approved uh, by national units, uh, it may be very important to use that official data set uh, in place of the globally available data sets provided by Trends.Earth. So how does this actually look? If you wanted to use this information in Trends.Earth, we'll show you a more detailed example in a minute. Uh, but there's, uh, again, focusing on the land cover example, there's two different ways uh, that you can uh, customize the land cover data within trends.earth. The first is to use the globally available land cover data provided in the tool, but modify the way in which the classes are aggregated. So the European Space Agency land cover change product has a range of different classes that are mapped. What we do in the trends.earth tool is combine them into a smaller subset of seven land cover classes. These are the land cover classes used by the IPCC for emissions reporting and by the UNCCD for tracking uh, and reporting on land degradation. So what you see here on the screen is input code is showing you uh, a class from the European Space Agency CCI product. And on the right-hand side is how that uh, class is represented within trends.earth. So for example, uh, with uh, tree cover classes, there can be nationally agreed upon definitions of what constitutes a forest. You can modify the way that these classes are represented at trends.earth to be consistent with that definition. Or if you notice, for example, that a particular class is being mapped as tree covered when it should be grassland, you can correct that here. This doesn't require using an additional data set. It's just a modification of the way the analysis is conducted. The second way that you can customize land cover data is to replace that global data set entirely uh, with a locally or nationally available data set. What's shown here is the screen that will allow you to read in information that you may already have and use it to replace the globally available data in trends.earth. Uh, so what these screens are showing is how you would tell the tool what, for example, uh, three means in your land cover product. Is that grassland? Is that tree covered? Is that urban, et cetera? Once this process is done, you can run the tools as we showed you uh, in the last session to produce a final summary table. What you see here is an example of the same analysis conducted using on the left, uh, the default 300 meter land cover data. On the right-hand side, a custom 30 meter land cover data set and what you'll see is there's slight differences uh, in the percentage land area improved or degraded. Not a huge difference here, uh, but in some areas that might be a different story. 
So again, just to recap, though I focused on uh, land cover change here and how custom land cover data can be used in trends.earth, this can be done across all three of the indicators in the tool. And for further information on how to use custom data for uh, land productivity or soil organic carbon, uh, you can see our materials available online at trends.earth. So thank you for your attention during that overview. Uh, now what I'm going to do is hand it over to Pablo Valles, who's the LDN country consultant uh, from the Dominican Republic. And he's going to speak uh, in a bit more detail about uh, the importance of custom uh, local and national level uh, data within uh, SDG reporting. And also just as a reminder, uh, for further information on anything I've just uh, discussed, you can of course see the website at trends.earth, and also for some of the global level data sets, maps.trends.earth. Pablo, over to you. Yo soy Pablo Valles, de, de República Dominicana. Eh, trabajo como consultor eh, para diferentes organizaciones locales y también el caso del mecanismo mundial para para apoyar a los países americanos en, en el uso de la herramienta Premier y luego preparación de los informes nacionales. Eh, trabajo de manera independiente y vivo en la República Dominicana actualmente. Ah, ok, eh, vamos a hacer un... brevemente vamos a, a ver lo, la, la experiencia que hemos eh, acumulado en el país y otros países que han participado, eh, con algunos antecedentes y precisamente los cálculos, cómo se han hecho los cálculos de la variación de la tierra en el país y, y otros países usando la herramienta. Especialmente eh, en el ejemplo de Dominicana, también que, cómo eh, hubo, fue el proceso de facilitación nacional y regional, y también algunas conclusiones y recomendaciones. Bien, eh, en el marco de la preparación de los, de, de la, los informes nacionales de la Convención de Naciones Unidas para la lucha contra la desertificación de la sequía, eh, eh, se introdujo una nueva herramienta para facilitar a los países la preparación de los informes. Eh, es un entrenamiento que se, se llevó a cabo en Brasil para todos los eh, puntos focales y los consultores que en ese momento fueron contratados eh, para ver cómo, cómo funcionaba la herramienta eh, en 3R eh, para cálculo de la verón de la tierra y reportar los repartir reporte de los países y facilitar eh, la aplicación. Eh, dicha herramienta, bueno, eh, ya conocemos cómo fue desarrollada y los apoyos que recibió para a través de la NASA y y la Universidad de Lund para, para facilitar y mejorar esta herramienta. En la primera experiencia eh, de la República Dominicana y muchos países de Latinoamérica, de Latinoamérica eh, es el uso básico de tres indicadores de la zona de la Tierra eh, en el que se desarrollaron el marco eh, de la, del programa establecido de las metas nacionales, eh, NDP. Eh, en conjunto estos tres indicadores que son la cobertura eh, forestal, eh, la pulpia de la tierra y el carbono orgánico del suelo, en, eh, en estos tres indicadores presentan el estado actual eh, de la relación de la tierra en, en los países. En el cálculo de la relación de la tierra, eh, utilizando igualmente datos locales, como datos globales, en este caso, eh, la República Dominicana optamos por usar, eh, la, hacer una combinación o no contar con los datos de, de la tierra, ni que abono van igual suelo, pero sí con cobertura de la tierra. Es, es un proceso bastante complicado eh, usando herramientas de GIS, porque combinar eh, las tres capas con diferentes resoluciones, eh, hacer correcciones. Eh, por las incertidumbres que presentaban estos, estos tres mapas, al combinarse entonces fue bastante complejo para, para los países que, que trabajamos con, con la preparación de las metas nacionales. 
En, en el caso de República se estimó que unas 4.960 kilómetros cuadrados, más o menos un 10% del territorio, estaba en proceso crítico de degradación. Eh, usando datos estáticos de la dinámica de la, de la tierra y carbono urbano del suelo, eh, combinamos otros, otros indicadores como la erosión del suelo, eh, pero también se fueron haciendo algunos ajustes eh, para reducir eh, las áreas eh, que estaban más degradadas o por lo menos tenerlas más prioritarias. Y para esto se seleccionaron a nivel de, de cuencas y subcuencas eh, para representar la que era la vega, no la tierra en, en este eh, Precisamente las la zonas más degradadas están localizada en las zonas áridas y semiáridas semi del territorio de la República Dominicana. El cálculo eh, de la ciudad a través de Tremier, esto facilitó considerablemente eh, por facilitar todo el proceso, eh, la estimación de la producción de la tierra degradada eh, para ser utilizado en los informes nacionales eh, los países miembros de la Convención, pudimos utilizar eh, esta herramienta con mucha facilidad, eh, también combinando datos globales eh, más actualizados y también datos locales. Esta Red eh, como ya hemos visto, es una plataforma eh, para monitorear el cambio de superficie de observación de la Tierra a través de, de los satélites. Eh, es un nuevo innovador de, para com, combinar los cálculos eh, con una interfaz de escritorio, buscando la, la, la software eh, GIS. Los tres indicadores para monitorear eh, el logro de la de la Tierra. Eh, el EDN y los ODS de la meta 15.3 eh, fueron cal calculados utilizando la herramienta eh, y también ayudaron a los países a, a tener mayor agilidad y mejor precisión en la información para reportar los informes, los informes nacionales. El uso de la herramienta tren -Air y la interfaz QG ha facilitado considerablemente el cálculo de tres indicadores eh, precisamente la verdad de la Tierra, eh, generando estadísticas y mapas de la porción de la Tierra degradada eh, que fueron presentados en los informes de la Convención eh, el año pasado. Eh, el sexto informe, eh, que es un compromiso de los países para reportar eh, el estado actual de la degradación de la Tierra. Permitió generar indicadores utilizando datos de fuentes locales como el caso de la cobertura terrestre, en varios países decidieron utilizar eh, los datos que disponían eh, en el caso de la, de la cobertura de la tierra eh, y la mayoría de los países no contaban con, con todos los, con los tres indicadores en su conjunto, sino que la mayoría los que contaban personalmente se con la cobertura de la tierra y los demás utilizamos eh, el carbono orgánico del suelo y la, y la de la tierra eh, de fuentes globales están disponibles en el, o fueron disponibles por la convención. Como ejemplo, en la República Dominicana eh, y otros países de la región, el tren e permitió calcular el indicador de degradación de, de la cobertura terrestre, en este caso utilizando más parte de cobertura preparado con imagen de lanza, eh, que tiene una resolución de 30 metros, eh, para el mismo periodo del informe, o sea, del 2000 eh, al 2015. Eh, como vemos aquí en la presentación, el mapa de Republicana eh, representa el estado de la degradación de la Tierra. Eh, lo que son los, los, los procesos de degradación, lo que es estable y lo que no ha sufrido cambio. Precisamente en, en estos casos, eh, obviamente los países insulares eh, que, no contaba, que no contaban con mapas 
eh, optaron por usar esta fuente. Realmente, eh, como, como caso especial, la republicana con una gran eh, diversidad de ecosistemas, las fuentes globales presentan grandes incertidumbres. Eh, en este caso, Trenger, eh, con Trenger se pudo eh, facilitar la reclasificación eh, para, para poder combinar con los, los indicadores. Eh, esta reclasificación, que son las siete clases eh, fundamentales para, eh, eh, para poder calcular eh, el estado de evasión de la tierra. La herramienta permitió la combinación de fuentes locales y globales para determinar eh, la proporción de la tierra de agrada de cada país. Eh, generar eh, de manera automatizada los mapas y la estadística eh, para poder completar la, la, los informes nacionales. Eh, como mencionamos, eh, estos, estos, los fuentes eh, locales eh, y datos globales que pudieron ser combinados, eh, en este caso eh, podemos observar una, una gran... Eh, proporción de tierra degradada en el territorio dominicano eh, si lo comparamos con el con la eh, utilizando la manera manual eh, o la manera no automatizada usando los, los sistemas GIS, los, los software GIS anteriormente explicados hay, hay una diferencia entre el resultado eh, y usando la herramienta eh, además el, el uno de los indicadores eh, que influye mucho en el proceso de evasión de la tierra es eh, la pulpe de la tierra, que, que, que no se eh, evidencia tan fácilmente en, en el terreno, sino a través de la, de la tele de eh, También como parte del proceso de la preparación de los informes nacionales, en la República Dominicana se realizó también un taller de capacitación sobre el uso de la herramienta. Eh, participaron un gran número de instituciones relacionadas con el uso del suelo. Eh, un taller eh, organizado en, en, por, por el Ministerio de Medio Ambiente. Eh, también recibimos la colaboración online de nuestro colega Mariano González. Y esta experiencia eh, es muy interesante, la motivación eh, de los participantes eh, para el uso de la herramienta, eh, por la facilidad que, que podemos generar la, los mapas, también usarla para, para descargar otro, otros eh, mapas fuentes de, de datos globales eh, que puedan ser utilizados en otros otro casos. Eh, de los eh, el apoyo también regional que pudimos eh, brindarle a los países latinoamericanos, en este caso eh, 27 países de la región, eh, tanto hispanos como anglosajones, utilizaron esta herramienta para el cálculo de los indicadores de la zona de la tierra y, y así poder cumplir con, con la, satisfactoriamente con la presentación de los informes nacionales en un tiempo bastante corto. Eh, algunos países eh, que no tuvieron la posibilidad de, de participar en el taller inicial, eh, también a través de, de la videoconferencia podemos apoyarlo y, y poder sacar productos eh, validados y, y, y con los mapas y las estadísticas eh, que requería el informe, en el caso de Haití, Ecuador, Guatemala, Paraguay, Colombia, también se trabajaron directamente con la herramienta y dando el apoyo paso a paso eh, para que pudieran tener un producto eh, bastante eh, aceptable. Eh, bueno, algunos países que todavía quedaron rezagados eh, también se motivaron al uso de la herramienta, en el caso de Nicaragua. Eh, al final de, del proceso eh, pudieron también preparar sus informes nacionales usando esta herramienta. Eh, entendemos que, 
que gran parte de los países que también eh, participaron eh, en el taller de Brasil, eh, hay otras, otros inconvenientes, pero que no, que pudieron ser resueltos a través de, del intercambio, es el caso de, de, la, de la proporción de la tierra degradada eh, por tipo de uso o cambio de uso de la cobertura. La herramienta no permite eh, de manera automatizada hacer este cálculo, eh, sino que hay que hacerlo de manera eh, manual, sino que también se, se, se traen los datos de, lo, de la de Trenger y se procesan luego en otro software que se pueda aplicar, puede ser el mismo QG o ARGIS, eh, como se prefiera o como sea más fácil para, para los países. En este caso, eh, los mapas de, proporcionados por Trenger como carbono orgánico en, en, y la cobertura o cambio de cobertura eh, se trajeron de, de los resultados de Trenger se pudieron hacer un cálculo de la proporción de carbono que se gana o se pierde en, en el periodo de 2000 a 2015 por tipo de cambio de cobertura. Bueno, eh, entendemos que, que algunas eh, observaciones y algunas recomendaciones que podríamos eh, informar a, mediante esta experiencia que hemos, que hemos compartido con ustedes, eh, promemos eh, en primer caso, Trenger permite, te permite utilizar las fuentes locales, o sea, no es, no es una herramienta eh, táctica, sino que puede, podemos hacer combinaciones eh, y que si, si, si los países disponen de, de, de fuentes locales, fácilmente pueden ser incorporadas a, a Trenger y hacer el mismo análisis que podemos hacer con las fuentes globales. Esta herramienta también facilitó considerablemente la preparación de los indicadores, indicadores de la región de la Tierra, sin embargo, se debe mejorar a, los, a algunos países la capacidad de sobreuso. Así eh, podemos tener eh, mayor eh, desarrollo de la herramienta y poder eh, que los países por sí solos puedan hacer el análisis eh, en los próximos informes o en el proceso de, de programa de neutralidad de la Tierra. En el futuro también se debiera incorporar a unos cálculos de otros indicadores a nivel de sus regiones, por ejemplo, departamental o provincia. Al principio hubo una dificultad para poder eh, extraer los datos a nivel, a nivel de, de, de las subregiones de cada país y estos procesos tuvo que hacerse de manera eh, independiente, o sea, hacer lo mismo con repetir el proceso en cada cierto tiempo o por cada subregión y sería interesante que se pueda hacer que estén él pueda calcularlo directamente y finalmente se debe haber un mayor una mayor comprensión por parte Ajá. de los países eh, de los detalles de los indicadores por ejemplo el carbono en el suelo y la, de la tierra conocer la metodología eh, para validarlo a nivel local. Porque ha sido también un proceso eh, que no todos los países han podido eh, validar los, los datos eh, que han utilizado, tanto la fuente local como los mismos resultados de eh, la herramienta. Y, y sería muy importante que también eh, se pueda, eh, pueda permitir un, un proceso de validación a nivel eh, local. Thank you, Pablo, for that discussion. Now I'm going to hand it to my colleague, Monica Noon, who's Senior Manager of Data Science for Resilience here at Conservation International. And she's going to show you how you might actually use some custom uh, local or national level data sets within the Trends.Earth tool. Over to you, Monica. All right, thank you very much. Again, this is Monica Noon. Um, I'm going to be walking through how to upload custom land cover data sets today and run the SDG 15.3 um, indicator as well using a custom data set. So if you uh, forgot to save your project, it's okay, you can start um, QGIS again, and I'll show you how to load your data sets that you ran 
as we demonstrated in session one again um, in a few minutes. But first, I'm going to show you how to upload a custom land cover data set. So we'll go back to the trends.earth plugin in QGIS and select calculate indicator. Um, again, we select land degradation indicator, that first option, and we'll actually go to option two now. So using customized data, here you can upload productivity data sets, land cover, and soil organic carbon. Um, since most countries have a national level data set at multiple time steps that has been validated, um, we're going to demonstrate land cover data today. So you select that middle option, uh, land cover. Um, so here you can see a very familiar screen um, for the land cover setup. So I'll go ahead and select a custom land cover data set because I'll be uploading my own. So since I haven't uh, ingested it into QGIS yet, I have uh, two geotiffs, I'll first select import. And here's where I'll pull in that information. So as you see here, I actually have two different uh, data sets for Uganda. So I'm going to select uh, the year 2000 data set. This is a data product from our CMRD, um, and, which is based out of Kenya. They've done some land cover mapping for many African countries in East and Southern Africa. So I can just pull in that TIFF right there. It only has one uh, band, but you can select from the drop down here if your data set has multiple bands. And I'll enter in the year of data. So right now I have a data set for 2000. Then I'm going to select the edit definition. Uh, if you remember from session one, um, there was this uh, the aggregation of land cover data sets. So um, the European Space Agency data pro uh, land cover data product has 37 classes. Um, this one has uh, 18 different classes. Um, now, there's not a lot of information here, so I'm going to refer back to the website. Um, this is our trends.earth website, which uses the same uh, data set as the tutorial data, um, which you can download directly from our website. Uh, and this is the uh, land cover data set. So I'm going to need to aggregate this into those seven land cover categories. Um, so as you can see here, we have 18, um, and we give instructions on how you can aggregate that um, down to the seven classes. So the first one is no data. I'll leave it there. Um, we have the next few are tree covered areas. Oops. Um, so one through seven, we have tree covered. Eight through 11 are grassland. And then we have cropland 12 through 14. And then the final ones are wetland, water body, artificial, and other land. Wetland. artificial and other land. Okay, so now that I have this, um, I don't wanna do that a second time. So I'm going to actually save that definition. Uh, we recommend that you do this every time because this is also very useful um, for remembering the analysis that you ran. So I'm going to say that it's Uganda. Scheme two is the data set from our CMRD. and I'll save that there. And I'll hit save again. So now we have that definition uh, of the land cover data set aggregated into seven classes, and we just need to save where that output will go. So I'm going to say Uganda, this is a custom land cover data product for the year 2000. I'll save that there. Select OK. Now this is going to be running locally. And this actually might take a few minutes to run. Um, 
Once that is completed, you'll see that this uh, data set is now available in the dropdown. So we're going to need to do that a second time with the second data set so we can get the uh, change over time of those two data sets. Now, this time when we select edit definition, instead of entering those in from the uh, information on our website, we can actually just load that definition again. You can see here that that has been populated very quickly. Now I hit save and I will also save the output. Custom line cover 2014. Now I can hit OK once again and it will load. Uh, once you've ingested both of your land cover data sets, you'll see the options of having these in the drop down. Um, you want to make sure that the dates appear correctly, so you have your initial year as 2000, your final year as 2014. Then you can select next. Um, again, we have this uh, degradation matrix um, where you can change whether you want the improving, degrading, or stable um, land cover transition categories. Um, anytime you make any changes, we recommend that you save that information so that you can replicate that same analysis later. So if I were to change something, I would save table to file. Um, I'm going to leave it with a default uh, transition as it is and select next. Uh, I'm going to run it on Uganda. Again, selecting next and uh, I'll name the task. Now this is going to be run locally on your computer. Um, so you can name the task and, and write some notes where you receive the data set from, any other details that you want to uh, indicate there, and then select calculate to get the custom land cover degradation. We need to save the output. And hit save. So now it'll process locally and give an output of that transition and land cover degradation at 30 meter resolution using this custom land cover data set. So once that has run, finished running locally on your computer, you can see that we have uh, four layers now. So we have um, the two land cover data sets, 2000, 2014. Um, we have the land cover degradation, which is what you saw when we calculated the three sub-indicators in session one, and we have the land cover transition. So this is uh, showing the different changes where you find um, loss in each category. And here's an example of that land cover degradation output. If you remember from the first session, um, the product was uh, a coarser resolution, um, and we'll compare those outputs in a minute. So now I want to bring in those other sub-indicators, since I'm not loading a full set of uh, a custom data sets. What I want to do is select this folder icon for load data and load an existing trends.earth output file. So if you remember, I calculated in session one all of those default indicators. So I'm going to bring in the three productivity layers. Um, I'll just bring in the land cover degradation so we can quickly compare those two outputs and the soil organic carbon degradation. And again, we can collapse this and turn off some of these layers so it doesn't take as long to load. And I want to just quickly compare using this um, zoom in icon the two uh, different land cover resolutions. So here we have the 2000 to 2014 and here we have the, the default indicator. We can see there's quite a difference with that resolution. There's a lot more detail in the land cover at 30 meter resolution 
than the one provided um, at 300 meter resolution. So just so I don't get confused, even though it indicates 2001 to 2015, I'm going to remove this. And then I'm going to go back to calculate indicators and calculate the final SDG 15.3.1 indicator. You'll see that uh, everything is populated. If I had kept that land cover data set in here, it would be uh, another option in this dropdown. So I would have had 2001 to 2015 with that coarser 300 meter resolution. Um, since I removed it, we only have one option and everything has been pre-populated here. So then I'll select next. Again, we need to uh, name our spatial outputs. And I'll just add 2000 custom land cover uh, to the name. A little shortcut is to copy that so you don't have to retype it for the Excel spreadsheet. Here again, I'm going to select an area. Um, so I'll use a more slightly more official boundary for Uganda. Select next and name that final output. Custom land cover SDG T31. So now instead of running on all the default indicators, we're running it on the default for uh, the productivity, the default data sets for soil organic carbon, but the custom land cover uh, degradation layer. So now this is going to run locally and it'll take a minute to run. Okay, once uh, that has finished running locally on your computer, um, it may take you know 10 or 20 minutes to run um, since it's a very fine resolution. Um, you'll see this final output um, which is land productivity. Um, so Alex presented in the earlier session um, about how that um, the land productivity is combined to f uh, with these three uh, productivity sub indicators. So now state performance and trajectory have been combined into this land cover productivity data set. And you can see from the legend, um, we actually have a little more information than just declining, stable, and increasing. We also have early signs of decline and we have stable but stressed. So this is important if you're um, kind of monitoring an area that may be uh, not fully experiencing land, land degradation, but um, is starting to see some symptoms of uh, and signs of land, land degradation. You can also get this final uh, SDG 15.3 degradation indicator. Um, and if you'll remember from the first session, we produced the same output, but that was using those custom level data sets. Uh, I can add that and we can compare the resolution as well. Here, I'll just add just the degradation. We can see there's some subtle differences in the final calculation due to that uh, finer resolution data set. Again, you'll have a, a final table um, which will summarize the data sets um, by each uh, breakdown of category as well. So that concludes session number two, using custom land cover data sets uh, to report and monitor SDG 15.3.1. Thank you. I'd like to thank our guest speakers again for being here with us today and providing us with those unique perspectives in the lecture and the exercise as well. Just to wrap things up, I again wanted to mention that if you have any follow-on questions, you can email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez. And um, we will also make the email addresses of the guest speakers available to you all if you wanna follow up with them with questions as well.
If you have any general RSET inquiries, you can email our program manager, Anna Prattis. And then again, feel free to visit our website to take a look at all the different types of trainings that we have available for you. So I'd like to thank you all for your participation. And as a reminder, we will have our next and final session a week from today on July 23rd. And we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about SDG 11 um, and uh, cities. And now we will have some time for questions. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to put them into the um, Q&A box there. And then we're going to, as we did last week, display the questions on the Google document and follow along um, that way and display them. And then eventually we will have the questions and the answers to those questions on the website. So you can refer back to those later again. Okay, great. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, please bear with us as we switch over to the um, document displaying the questions. And just a reminder, do add your questions to the Q&A box as they come up and um, we will go through them one by one. So this is Alex uh, Zwolf again from Conservation International. Thank you everyone for listening in on the webinar today. And of course, please keep your questions coming in if you do have more uh, that you would like to send in. We'll make sure that we get them into the Q&A box. So uh, we'll start going through these. I know that these are still coming in, so uh, we'll give it a second uh, so that they can get transcribed into the document. Uh, but for the first question, question one is, what differentiates land degradation from desertification? How can trends.earth be used to track desertification versus just land degradation? Uh, so this is a great question and one that now I realize we didn't address in the first webinar. Uh, so desertification, I would say, is a more specific type of land degradation. Uh, so desertification tends to refer to arid or semi-arid areas where you have uh, loss of soil, loss of water bodies, uh, and conversion of uh, land to desert. Right now, in the land degradation community, there's a broader focus, so looking at additional types of land degradation. In fact, uh, the UNCCD has started referring to DLDD, or desertification, land degradation, and or drought. Uh, so there's a recognition that there's a broader set of challenges beyond uh, the challenge of desertification alone. Uh, so for that reason, we typically use the broader term land degradation rather than desertification per se. In terms of the second question, how can trends.earth be used to track desertification versus just land degradation? Uh, what you might look at here are, uh, well, two things I would suggest looking in a bit more detail at your land cover data sets. I'd recommend uh, perhaps using a custom land cover data set where you can more accurately capture transitions uh, to or from uh, uh, desert classes. A uh, second thing that you might do is look at the productivity indicator uh, where you can uh, try and include uh, the impacts of climate on the signal that you're detecting and productivity. That's something we don't go into detail in, in this webinar, but if you go to the trends.earth uh, website, you can look at how you might uh, try to pull out um, some of the climatic signals uh, as well, which uh, would be important in that case. And then for uh, question two, could you use very high resolution, whoops, sorry, I lost the screen. Um, could you use very high spatial resolution images, for example, from drones to analyze the indicators in a small area? I would say, yes, you certainly could. Here, drone imagery would be most useful, again, for land cover. Given for land productivity, you will need a longer time series in order to detect trends. So 
although you can measure NDVI from a drone, you're not going to have the long time series that you would need to detect trends there, uh, but you can certainly use it to produce a high resolution map of land cover, and you can import that data set then into trends.earth using the process that Monica described. Um, for question three, I have installed the QGIS 2.18.28, and I don't know why I can't find the plugin. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but what I would encourage you to do is email us directly, uh, and we can uh, look into what might be going on on your computer. And uh, again, you'll see those emails. Uh, it's trendsearth at conservation.org, or you'll see uh, Monica's email and my email at the top of this document. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, um, when you're installing a plugin, there's actually, I think, two or three options uh, in the menu. Um, so there'll be something, I think it says installed. So you may actually have it filtered by the installed plugins on your machine. And um, just uh, when you're sending any emails with questions on the, the toolbox, um, just include a screenshot of where you're both the error and then what you've done um, to reduce the error, I can say, um, and we can better help you. But it may just be filtered for um, which plugins are in, already installed, and that's why you're not seeing it even when you search for it. Um, so again, just email us directly at trends.earth at conservation.org, and we can um, help you out there. So then for question four, can we forecast or project future land cover with trends on Earth? For example, predicting land cover for year 2050 or even 2070 and 2100? There's a simple answer there, it's no. Um, uh, we don't support right now uh, land cover projections. We are talking about uh, developing tools to better support scenario analysis so that you could analyze um, different scenarios of land change in, in an area that is not yet released, uh, but we don't have um, projection of land cover that far in the future uh, on the timeline right now. Question five, when will trends.earth be available in QGIS 3? Excellent question, which we've gotten multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, something we're actively working on. We do have uh, the initial changes made uh, certainly before the end of the year, uh, hopefully more uh, soon than that. So we'll be sure to, of course, post on our website as soon as it's available, uh, and then also send out a, a broader email as well as soon as the plugin's available in QGIS 3. And if you are interested in uh, QGIS, I'd encourage playing around. There's a lot of uh, great new features in the new version of QGIS, especially for making maps and figures. So it's a great uh, uh, new version of the software. Question six, there's a need to allow for computation of land degradation at lower levels of administration. For instance, Kenya moved from the provinces to county government. How will this be updated in the tool? Secondly, how can one compute land degradation for multiple countries and have the output as one QGIS project layer? Uh, so for the first part of the question, this is also something that we've heard uh, from, there's many countries where you have decentralized uh, governance where there's a need to calculate uh, the indicators at a lower level. And typically what we've heard is there's a need to get the PDF or rather the Excel reports for, for example, every uh, county or every ward, depending on what country you're in. We do have actually a, a button in the tool that says coming soon. Uh, so this is something we are actively working on. Uh, what we're trying to figure out is the best format for those reports um, so that it can be something that can calculate easily on your computer or in the cloud when you're working with uh, custom data sets, for example. So there's some details we need to work out, uh, but yes, it's a need that we're aware of and uh, we will support. Uh, the second question, secondly, how can one compute LD for multiple countries and have the output as one QGIS project layer? Uh, for that part of the question, 
I guess it would, I'd say it depends on what you need, but you can calculate multiple countries if you submit your own shapefile. So if you create a shapefile that joins whatever countries you need together, you can run a task to calculate degradation across all the countries at the same time. And that will give you a single map showing all of those countries. You could then run reports on each country individually or on all three, depending on what you need. Is there anything you'd add, Monica? Or... Maybe just the limit on size. Oh, yes. Uh, and we do have, uh, there'd be a limit on the size that you can run uh, in terms of area. So do let us know if you need to run a large number of countries and we can set something up for you so that you can uh, do that successfully. Question seven. Uh, so the main part of the question is, how can I calculate SDG 15 for two or five years? So we limit you, which is what you've obviously noticed. You will get an error message if you try to run an analysis for a period of less than 10 years. The reason we do that is because the productivity analysis is based on a trend. Uh, and we're trying to prevent analysis of very short time periods where you're likely to have a fair amount of noise in the NDVI just due to variation in climate. Um, there's no reason the analysis couldn't be run for a shorter period technically. The reason we have that limitation is to make sure that in a uh, large number of cases you'll get valid results. So if you wanted to look at SDG 15 for two or five years, I would suggest that you not <laughs> um, because it really does take, you need sufficient data for the productivity indicator to get a meaningful trend. Um, but you could of course always email us and let us know what exactly it is you're trying to analyze and we might have some suggestions about uh, what you would like what would make the most sense for your case. But in general, for the SDG 15, uh, we'd suggest allowing at least 10 years to make sure you have enough data in the productivity indicator. Um, so for question eight, there was a question on um, the QGIS exercise results for the homework. Um, and I see that our colleagues at NASA have already answered that it's not necessary to um, submit your results. Um, They'll have a Google form available next week for the homework. And I just like to add if there's any um, open ended questions, um, it's it's mo mostly just to answer some of um, kind of our curiosities about how people use the tools. So there's no right or wrong answers. Um, so just go ahead and answer those um, for whatever work you're interested in running the tool on. Uh, and then question nine is it possible to join the three indicators? analyzed with NDVI with other spectral indices. Certainly you can do that, uh, right? You need to do that directly within QGIS or other software. So we don't support that within Trends.Earth. Uh, and I think we just support NDVI, right? We're not a DVI. No, we don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was an aside. <laughs> uh, but Yes, it's so certainly possible, but you would need to do it directly within the software. So it's not something you can do within the plugin. The QGIS is a full GIS system. So you can uh, certainly do all kinds of other analyses with these data sets. So question 10 is, I work in Mongolia where the data is difficult to find at finder scales. So if I want to find scale land cover for an area, would I have to classify the area twice, covering an old date with a recent date? Um, so I'll answer that question. So since we are looking at the actual transitions to classify um, degradation in land cover, you will need two separate land cover maps. So you need two land cover maps at different points in time, um, preferably at the beginning and end of the, the dates that you're running the analysis on. And then you referred to a map that Alex showed with red dots for um, cover classification. Um, did you create training polygons around those locations for land cover classification? So I think what you're referring to is the vital signs, yeah, data sampling protocol. 
Um, so this is something that we've used in several African countries. Um, it's just a randomized sampling approach. Um, so what we did is we, we ran um, a randomized uh, sampling, like point sampling, um, within the land cover types, like proportional to land cover types in, in the country. So we were creating um, land cover maps. We used existing validated land cover maps to determine what proportion of each land cover um, existed within the country. Um, and then proportionately um, took samples in those different land cover categories. Um, we can also follow up and send you a link to that information on the Vital Signs website. It's vitalsigns.org um, that shows how we both create those sampling protocols and carry out data collection in the field. Yeah, and sorry, no, I was trying to find the, that map again to tell you the colors. There's either red or black dots on there that show what we call rapid roadside assessments. And so what those were is building on what Monica just said, those are places where in the field we conducted a quick assessment of the land cover at an area and percentage within different classes, and that can be used then to validate uh, doing land cover maps that are derived from that area. But as Monica was saying, you can get more information on that on the website. Uh, question 11. The Caribbean region is usually not covered in the global data set. What alternative is there that captures degradation besides the ESA 300 meter? Uh, so what this question is referring to, and we didn't talk about this in detail, mm -hmm. but there's two different productivity data sets in trend.earth. Uh, one is derived from a product from the Joint Research Commission, JRC, called the Land Productivity Dynamics, or LPD, data set. So that's the default data set that was produced, or released, rather, by the UNCCD to support reporting uh, during the last cycle. The second is uh, a data set uh, produced by the Trends Daughters tool uh, to assess uh, land productivity that is drawing on different input data from the JRC data set. So the Trends Daughters version is 250 meters, the JRC is 300 meters, the JRC is actually drawing, though, on input data that's one kilometers, so it's a coarser input data set going into that layer. So I suggest looking at the Trends on Earth data set. The resolution appears the same, but the JRC one is actually resampled to 300 meters, so it is a coarser data set. Uh, so I'd recommend comparing those two to see which works best in your area. Then also, uh, we have a new research project that's starting up soon where we'll be using uh, Landsat and Sentinel data uh, to map productivity at 20 to 30 meter resolution, which I think will be much better uh, for the Caribbean region given uh, the needs that you mentioned. Uh, so um, that's something that will be coming out within the next year and will be supported within Friends Uh Question 12. How can QGIS slash trends.earth be linked to gathering data about natural capital, the amount or value of natural resources, and the percentage of natural resources over exploitation to measure the inclusive wealth metric? So trends.earth is focused on assessing degradation. So I think it would be most useful in assessing land condition. Uh, there's additional information beyond that that you would want to draw on to understand uh, ecosystem services uh, provided by a given area as well as where beneficiaries are located. So you would want to bring in additional information as well. So there are other projects, of course, focusing on that, the Natural Capital Project, for example. Uh, there's some work we need here out of the Conservation International and Natural Capital Accounting. Uh, so I'd say Trends.Earth could be very useful as an input layer to assess particular land condition, but you will want to bring in additional information from other tools as well. Uh, we can find all, so I think the next question 13 is asking if Data on land degradation can be found for all countries in the tool, for example, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. 
The answer is yes, it's a global tool. So you should be able to find data for both of those countries uh, within Transdotter. Yeah, and I'd say just to follow up, we have a disclaimer at that um, step in the process under area. Um, you can select from the dropdown, but that's just from the natural earth data set that we can um, publicly distribute. Um, so if you have a um, administrative boundary, like a boundary of your country um, or other administrative boundaries, province, county, et cetera, um, you would like to load that yourself. So you can select the area from file and load a shape file um, using that area of interest. And there's lots of um, resources where you can download administrative boundaries like GADM. Um, however, we're not allowed to distribute that uh, due to the licensing. So um, you would have to go and, and download that yourself to get those boundaries as well. And then uh, for question 14, while using custom 30 meter land cover data by keeping SOC and land productivity at 300 meter resolution, how does it improve the accuracy when the default data are still at a lower resolution? So there's, I guess, two things I would say. First is, if you do use custom land cover data, we didn't have time to demonstrate it here, but you can use that land cover data uh, to calculate SOC at the same resolution. So you can calculate a 30 meter uh, SOC change product using your custom data. So I'd recommend that you do that so that you are using the same land cover data for soil organic carbon as you are for the land cover indicator. So that's the first thing I'd recommend. But then the second part of the answer is you're correct. The land productivity data will still be at 300 meter resolution. So you aren't gaining any accuracy and productivity from using custom land cover data. What you are doing is you're improving your ability to detect more finely scaled changes in land cover, and that will then flow through to your calculation of SOC as well, if you follow the first recommendation I made. So you're correct. It would, of course, be better to have all of the input data at 30 meters. Uh, as I mentioned in response to a prior question, we're working on that for productivity. Uh, but there is, is still benefit to using a custom land cover data set, even when you stick to the global data for productivity. For question 15, is it possible to calculate the SDG for a very small scaled area, such as quaternary catchment, on the other hand, and can one run for the whole of Canada? Is the area too large? Uh, so in response to this, the answer is yes for both. You can run it for a very small scaled area and you can run it for a very large area, although we do place a limit at the high end, we will be fine for Canada. Uh, but particularly on the low end, remember the default data is 300 meter resolution. So if you're running for a very small area, you're not going to have very much data. Uh, available for your area. So uh, always uh, be cognizant of the spatial scale we're dealing with. Uh, for question 16, do you see a possible enhancement and development of tools for land use change evaluation in urban areas, higher resolution with uh, such a diverse set of spectral signatures? There's definitely need to better capture changes in urban areas, uh, certainly. Right now for UNCCD reporting, those areas are typically all mapped artificial. So there isn't much differentiation there in terms of the seven classes that we include in the tool. Um, so I think there would be benefit, but you would need to think about whether or not those additional classes are needed in order to actually identify changes in degradation for the topic that we're looking at here. I'd say in most cases, you're unless you're interested specifically in degradation within urban areas and you have a very high resolution land cover map, you're probably going to be fine using the global data. Uh, but if you have a question that's focused on urban areas, certainly you would need higher resolution data to get a likely a larger number of classes and a higher uh, spatial 
resolution. Also, I'd encourage you to listen to the third webinar, which will be on mapping changes in urban extent, so that may be relevant given uh, your interests. Uh, is it possible to correlate land degradation and land cover change to extreme climatic events, droughts, and extreme rainfall using trends.earth? Uh, again, this is something where trends.earth would provide the input data you would need. So you could produce the maps of land degradation or land cover change. You can also, through the download data tool, download a number of data sets uh, on climate. Uh, but you would need to do additional processing in order to actually calculate that correlation and then also calculate the occurrence of extreme events. So it, it's possible within QGIS, uh, it's not something we support natively. Should we add like the future stuff with droughts? Oh yes, sorry, good point. And Monica just reminded me the new research project I mentioned earlier that will be starting soon Part of that will have to do with uh, better supporting indicators of uh, drought vulnerability. And there will be uh, new data sets that we'll be making available through the tool in that project. So that would likely be relevant um, to this question. I'm going to take this one. So, question 18 um, How are the default data sets selected in trends.earth? Um, given that there are many other options available from NASA, USGIS, GS, and ESA. Um, so we selected the default data sets um, using the good practice guidelines that was adopted by the UNCCD. So this was a report that was provided by CSIRO um, out of Australia, um, which recommended this methodology that we have in, available in the toolbox. So um, we to start the project, we actually did an evaluation with um, our partners at NASA over the methodology that um, that we could use productivity as a proxy for land degradation. Um, so they reviewed various methods, um, residual trends, EVI trends, uh, RUE, rain use efficiency. efficiency water use efficiency. So these are actually all available in the toolbox as well. You can run analysis by selecting a different um, option if you run the productivity on its own. Um, however, at the end of our project, um, our partners at NASA recommended that NDVI trends um, were the, I guess, recommended methodology to be using um, for productivity. Else to add. Yeah, and I think the other uh, consideration for the default data sets also is the length of the time series. And so, uh, as we've alluded to, going forward, we'll have higher resolution productivity data, 20, 30 meters, given the satellites we now have in the sky. But going back in time, of course, we're limited to what was up there. So for that reason, uh, we're dropping on the MODIS record, which goes back to 2001 as well as there is support for ADHRR as well, a longer resolution to go further back in time to 82. Uh, so that's the other consideration is what is actually available historically so that we can calculate uh, trends. Uh, the next question, sorry, lost myself here. High resolution data sets usually have larger errors. How are these errors accounted for in land degradation mapping? Great question, and I'd say they're not accounted for well now. Uh, so right now, in terms of if you're talking about reporting, uh, accuracy isn't directly taken into account other than evaluation of the data sets and products uh, prior to usage and reporting, but there's no agreed upon methodology to directly consider the accuracy of a given map. Um, and how that might influence the, the ultimate results that you use in reporting. Uh, so certainly I agree with high resolution data. This is something uh, that you need to be uh, very aware of. So we'd recommend you conduct a full accuracy assessment of any products that you use within the tool. Uh, if you're using custom data sets, and the other thing to think about is not just the accuracy of the maps individually, uh, but one advantage of the 
global data sets that we draw on is, yes, they're coarser in spatial resolution, but they're constructed to be consistent in time. So the methodology allows for comparison across time between individual years of the land cover data set. That's not necessarily going to be the case for maps that were independently constructed. Um, so you can be accumulating error if you have uh, two land cover maps uh, where the accuracy is particularly high, and then you use those uh, to map uh, change across time. Uh, question 20. Our main interest is to map changes in land use management practices towards or against regenerative agriculture or land management. So we would need to set up our own classes, for example, crop center conventional till uh, versus uh, crop center conservation till. Otherwise, is it something that's going to be available in future versions? Um, in terms of, so I think the question here is, can you alter? the land cover classes i believe is what you're asking uh you cannot now it wouldn't be too hard to um, integrate so it's something we can put on the list and yeah is there anything you would add Monica? i'd just say that um if the your question is addressing um these land cover changes um, you can actually use the tool if you just need to produce a land cover change map very quickly um, if you're trying to use the default data sets and differentiate those two different classes i don't think there's a way to do that now without having information from the field um, and seeing because the the esa product does have 37 classes so it's very detailed and if you're finding that you know the the change um, or the sorry the, the two categories um, are mapped differently I guess you could break those out but you'd still have to aggregate right yeah I mean you could kind of fake it with the way it's implemented now but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll definitely add this to the list of something that we should think about yes um, question 21 can you suggest any published research work done by you to understand the tool and its outcome so if you go to the website, there's a list of publications. Um, so trends.earth, uh, and click on the publications link on the far left, and that will give you uh, a list of recent publications. There's actually some more we need to add as well from other folks that cite uh, trends.earth, uh, but we'll make sure we keep that list up to date. Uh, question 22, can we run land degradation for specific areas in a country with trends.earth, where can we find custom data? Uh, yes, you can. You can run it for any country. As Monica mentioned earlier, we have some default spatial layers included that you can select depending on the country, a state, or a county, the first subnational unit. Uh, we'd recommend you access your own national level maps if you can, as that will be a more accurate polygon. Uh, where can you find custom data? That's something that uh, I would suggest you reach out to, whether it's the Ministry of Environment or uh, Department of Remote Sensing, like statistics, or the geology statistics office. Yeah. Yeah. Um, depending on where you are, there may be regional centers like um, the Severe Partners, mm -hmm. uh, for example, that have produced land cover maps. Um, so yeah, there's various sources depending on what region you're in, or of course you can also uh, uh, either commission or produce a custom data set yourself. Uh, what map projection can one use for trends.earth, especially for imported data? The projection needs to be defined and it needs to be something that QGIS uh, is, can interpret. Easiest way to check is drag your data into QGIS and see if it opens in the right place. <laughs> if you get an error message uh, saying QGIS can't recognize the projection, then trends.earth won't be able to either. Um, do we have anything on the FAQ on how to fix projections? We can, uh, if you're having issues, there are, I'd suggest you Google uh, QGIS guidance on how to define projections if your projection isn't defined, uh, but provided that it is, it should work fine in the tool. 
and the way the tool works is it will, for any analyses uh, done in the cloud, it will reproject your data to a common projection, but it will ensure that areas are calculated accurately. Or if you go into much more detail than that, but we'll leave it there for now. <laughs> um, has the tool been validated over West Africa? That's question 24. Um, so we did it work with Centre de Cité Logique and Senegal was one of the partners uh, for the first phase of the project. Uh, we've also been working in Ghana, in Liberia. Soon to be Nigeria. Soon to be Nigeria. That's where Michael will be heading there in a few weeks. Um, so yes, it's been used. Uh, although most of our initial work was in East Africa, we certainly worked in West Africa as well. Uh, adding to question 18, was the use of ensembles of trends based on different indices investigated? What do participants think about this option for further development? I think it's a great idea. Uh, no, we don't use ensembles of trends based on different indices, but certainly um, I think it's a good idea. And we did mention, I'm not sure I, if you're just referring to productivity or more broadly, uh, to land degradation as a whole. In response to the last webinar a question there, I mentioned the World Atlas of Desertification uses an approach to trying to bring together a large number of data sets to see if there's a convergence of evidence uh, indicating degradation in a particular area. That's sort of a similar idea, so that's something I'd suggest you look at. Uh, but certainly a great idea, and I'd encourage you to investigate that uh, in your area. Question 26, how do we see how updated the data sets are in trends? You can, I think you can, oh perfect, <laughs> but I was making sure. Uh, if you go to the download data tool in trends uh, it's one of the icons on the toolbar. There's a screen that will show you the starting and ending year for each data set. So that will let you view the years uh, available resolution. Uh, for each of the data sets in the tool. Uh, in general, we try to keep things update when the new data sets are released. For productivity, we sort of lag by part of the year. Uh, so for example, for we just added, well, actually earlier in the year, the data up to the end of 2018. Once this year is done, we'll add productivity up to the end of uh, 2019. But then the update dates for other data sets just varies on the producer. And I think that's all that we have for questions. Uh, so unless any more come in, that looks like it. So I want to thank everyone again for listening into the webinar and I will hand it back over to the RSET team. Great, thank you, Alex and Monica, um, for your answers to all these questions. Um, and thank you all for being here with us today. Um, just a few reminders. We will have the, um, these Q&A um, documents posted on the course website within about a week or so. Um, so if you want to refer back to the answers to your questions, you'll be able to do so um, on the course website. Um, and next week, we will be discussing, um, we shifting gears. Oops, so there's the, the website shown there um, being displayed. So um, for this session, you'll be able to download those presentation slides as well as the um, PDF of the exercise from today. Um, and then we'll have next week's um, located there online as well. And we're going to be shifting gears to um, the urban landscape for um, part three, which is our final week next week um, so please do join us for that and also at that time we will have the link to the homework um, which will be a um, google form that you will fill out and it will have questions from each session of this training series um, so please refer back to the website um, to take a look at that as well um, so thank you all again and have a great day